Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome to my shop. I'd like to show you a project that has kept me absolutely fascinated for the past couple of months. The first 50 years of photography were the era of large box cameras made primarily of wood. Although the first versions were simple devices, they rapidly evolved into clever, sophisticated designs. These large format cameras, often called view cameras, were still in widespread use by newspaper photographers in the middle of the 20th century. My daughters developed an interest in the earliest form of photos, which employed glass or metal plates covered with collodion. This requires a large format camera of some type. One look at these intriguing wooden cameras, and I was hooked. I wanted to try to build one in the worst way. Regardless of whether you're a photography buff or not, the woodworking challenge here will appeal to everyone who likes to build things. But before we start, it's important to understand the unique power of these large format designs. View cameras are capable of taking photos that are impossible with ordinary cameras. For instance, any camera can easily focus object A onto the film. However, object B is much closer to the camera and it will be inevitably focused far behind the film plane, resulting in blurring. The view camera, though, has an easy solution. Just tilt the film plane, and both objects come into perfect focus. Our view camera can also tilt the lens around two different axes and shift its position up and down to provide astonishing control over perspective and composition. All these movements add considerable complexity to the construction project, however. The first challenge is design. I couldn't find any plans for the kind of camera I wanted, so I looked at as many photos of old cameras as I could and tried to extract the key design principles. Then I drew my own tentative plans. There were many, many changes as the project progressed. The camera can be divided into three major parts, the base, the front frame, and the back frame. Let's start with the base. You're looking at the base right here. I need to cut a slot for the focusing shaft before other parts start to get in the way. I will mount two small pinion gears on this shaft. They will engage with two rack gears located directly above them. I cut out holes that will allow free movement of these pinion gears using my scroll saw. It actually took me much longer to be sure I was cutting in exactly the right spot than it did to actually cut the holes. Next, I cut a strip of wood that will form two guides along the sides of the base. These guides have two separate functions. They hold the T-track that you see here, which allows the camera back to slide forward, and they guide the assembly that allows the lens support mechanism to slide forward and backward. It's part of the focusing mechanism. They get glued and clamped securely to the base. Once the glue was set, I glued two thin strips onto the sides. This is largely cosmetic. It just makes the two major parts of the cameras have the same surface appearance from the side. The rack gears are held by two strips shaped to slide under the T-track channels that we just glued in place. They will be part of a simple frame that holds everything in alignment. But first, we need to anchor the racks in their place. Here I'm just showing you how the racks fit into a slot that I sawed into these strips. However, before we install them, we need to cut away a shallow rabbet or recess to provide clearance for the pinion gears, which are raised up a little bit above the base to allow the teeth to engage. This is the frame that will soon house the racks. This frame is the key element of the front focusing system. It will support the front lens assembly and enable it to slide forward and backward. While the pinions are steel, the racks are acetal, a rugged engineering plastic. Acetal has several virtues. Precision parts can be molded, which makes the parts much cheaper than their metal counterparts, which have to be machined. Acetal is also quiet and slick, requiring no lubrication. 
However, that also means that glues do not stick very well to slick, glassy, smooth surfaces. So I texturized the bottom of the racks with a tiny drill. I set them in epoxy, which has pretty good mechanical strength. It'll lock these tiny holes together. Here's a preview of how this rack and pinion system will work after it's all assembled. This square frame is the front of the light tight portion of the camera. The bellows will be attached to the back of this frame. In it, I cut a recess, which will hold the lens board, which in turn holds the lens itself. Vertical supports will allow this lens support frame to tilt, move up and down, and rotate around a vertical axis. Cutting rabbits is easy work with the rabbiting bit in my router. The workpiece presses against a bearing on the bit, which maintains a uniform recess and eliminates the need to set up a fence. However, it leaves round corners. Those can be squared up with a chisel. If the chisel is sharp, you can just shave off thin layers until you have cleaned out the whole corner. Most lenses produced in the 20th century came from the factory mounted on a lens board. I bought a used lens that was not mounted, so I had to cut a hole in the lens board to exactly fit the lens barrel. My lens barrel was 62 millimeters, and I did not have a 62 millimeter drill bit, so I mounted a square of wood into my lathe and turned a hole that I adjusted until it was a good fit for my lens. For safety reasons, I left the lens board much thicker than I needed for the finished product. I then ran all four sides through my table saw, very carefully setting the blade height so that I would leave four small islands of wood to keep the two halves of the piece together. You can see these uncut islands in this view and again in this one. A chisel will split the two halves apart very easily, cut away any remaining protrusions flush with the surface, and plane it to the desired thickness. The lens board and its frame are supported by two uprights set on a horizontal beam. Here's the assembly mounted on its base with the uprights folded down. This beam permits rotation around a vertical axis and provides a home for two aluminum brackets that permit the lens frame assembly to fold down for storage. These brackets are just cut from ordinary aluminum angle stock. And then shaped at the disc sander. They sit in shallow recesses in the wood beam that makes positioning much easier. Once it's all put together, the lens support works like this. It holds the lens board in a frame, which tilts and slides up and down. The lens board can be removed without tools if you need to change lenses. Now let's do the back frame. This dark wood beam is the sliding carriage that supports the camera back and the aluminum brackets that permit the back to fold down or tilt. The sliding carriage for the camera back rides in a T-track. Thin wood strips glued to the bottom of the beam keep the carriage aligned in its tracks. This test fitting lets you see how these pieces interconnect. The box that houses the bellows and holds the camera back sits on top of this beam fixed by two screws that permit it to fold up and down. You can also see how the front frame, with its upright supports folded down, fits into the back carriage when the camera is closed. It's a tight fit in this closed position. Another 10 millimeters all around would have made everything easier. Two bolts anchor the back frame and the bellows box to the track in the base. I located these as far forward as possible to make the knurled nuts easier to access. As you can see, it's pretty easy to move the back frame and lock it in any position. 
Next, we need to make the camera back itself. This is a mechanism that holds the ground glass viewing screen and permits the film holder to slide into the same space. The starting point is a strong frame made with half lap joints. The large amount of overlapping grain makes for an extremely strong join. The frame sits snugly into the box that holds the bellows. It rests on strips of wood that help to form the light seal. The film holder has ridges on it that position it exactly in the opening. This frame then needs recesses that exactly match those ridges. I measured those ridges very carefully and then off camera I routed the shallow grooves using a very small router bit. Hopefully you can see how they mate. Let me show that one more time up a little closer. Next, I glued on strips of wood that form a three-sided enclosure for the film holder. These need to fit closely, but they should not interfere with the ability of the film holder to slide in and out. I put strips of tape on the sides of the film holder as insurance that the sides will not be too tight. Since photographers sometimes want to turn the film horizontally for landscape mode and vertically for portrait mode, we need a mechanism for rotating the camera back. It's square, so it'll fit in any orientation, but it needs clips that hold it in place. There are several ways to make retaining clips. I cut slots in each corner of the camera back. I then made aluminum clips to fit those slots. Two of the clips needed ears or handles bent at an angle that allow them to be opened without using tools. I don't have sheet metal tools or a hydraulic press. However, I have a pair of dies that fit into my vise. It's a very low-tech solution, but it's effective. Clear packing tape helps discourage surface damage. You could also cut these shapes from preformed aluminum angle. Now that I think about it, that actually sounds a lot easier. Let me show you how the camera back fits into its recess in the bellows box. It fits in any orientation. On my next camera, I'm going to make the corner clips daintier. The final piece is the viewing screen. This is a wooden frame with the exact same dimensions as the film holder. It has a recess that supports a piece of ground glass. The recess is designed to put the glass in exactly the same position as the film in the film holder. You can see how the film holder slides under it and raises it up. The front edge is tapered to make it easy to slide the film holder under it. The viewing screen assembly is held in place by springs. I cut two leaf springs from a flexible stainless steel ruler like the one shown on my workbench. I cut some little pegs from 5mm stainless rod and epoxied them into the sides of the ground glass holder. The pegs will fit under the springs. They sit in shallow notches in the camera back. I cut those with a chisel and then later smooth the cut surfaces with a Dremel burr. Here is the finished camera back in place. You can see the ground glass, which has a Fresnel lens over it. You can see the clips that hold the camera back snugly into the bellows box. This view of the camera front shows the lens, the lens board, the lens board frame, and the mechanism that permits shifting and tilting the position of the lens. Here's the camera in its folded closed position for storage or transportation. It is reasonably compact and weighs a little over three kilograms or a little over seven pounds. This view shows the camera fully extended for long focal length lenses. Incidentally, I made the bellows too. That's a separate and fairly big production that I may show in a separate video later. Here's the camera in its fully compressed position. 
with just a small modification, it would be possible to allow an even shorter focal length. I'll be a little smarter the next time. I thought you might want to see how all this hardware unfolds itself. I didn't invent this mechanism, but I kind of wish I had because I think it's clever. By the way, the face of the camera looks a little different here from some earlier views because I added two aluminum brackets to the sides of the lens board frame to make the tilt mechanism work better. Okay, that's the project. I hope you found it interesting. Sorry, no plans at this point. As always, thanks for watching.